I'm Gina Acosta, Editor-in-Chief of Progressive Grocer, and welcome to another episode. Actually, this is the last episode of the year. I cannot believe this year is almost over. Uh, of the Top Women in Grocery podcast, a podcast focused on the trends, topics, and interests that move women forward in grocery retail. So in this podcast series, we've really been trying to shine a light on extraordinary women in the grocery industry who have had successful careers and interesting lives and who are also making a positive impact in their workplaces and in their communities. Uh, so we're thrilled to have launched this podcast this year on our 100th birthday. Uh, yes, Progressive Grocer has been around 100 years, covering every nook and cranny of the grocery industry. And so without further ado, I just want to introduce uh, my guest today on the Top Open and Grocery podcast, who is Tina Pothoff, Senior Vice President of Communications at Hy-Vee. Now, for those of you who are out there who may not be super familiar with Hy-Vee, I don't know how you could not be because it's one of my favorite grocery stores in the, in the world. Um, the company is an Iowa-based employee-owned corporation operating more than 285 retail stores across eight Midwestern states with sales of more than $13 billion a year. Uh, the supermarket chain is synonymous with quality, variety, convenience, healthy lifestyles, culinary expertise. Oh my gosh, their food service game is so amazing. And superior customer service. Hy-Vee ranks in the top five most trusted brands uh, in the US and has been named one of America's top three favorite grocery stores. The company's more than 80,000 employees provide a helpful smile in every aisle to customers every day. And, you know, I was just on a on a store trip, a store visit trip a couple of weeks ago in the Chicago area. And I was actually in the uh, exurbs of Chicago and I stopped in a high V in the exurbs. And I was so thrilled to see that sign all over the store, you know, helpful smile in every aisle. It just made me feel so warm and fuzzy. <laughs> anyway, Tina, thank you for being here uh, with me on the PG Twig podcast. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you so much for having me on. I'm really excited to be on today. So before we dive in, our listeners would love to learn, I'm sure, more about you. Can you just tell us a story about what brought you on this specific career path, how long you've been with hy V, et cetera, et cetera? Yeah, absolutely. I'm happy to talk about it. Um, I didn't land in retail um, like the way many people do. I actually uh, have a background in marketing and communications and uh, served as a local news anchor um, across the Midwest uh, in the beginning of my career. Um, I worked in journalism for about 15 to 16 years. And then when I was in Des Moines, ended up getting out of Des Moines um, and being a part of uh, the Iowa Lottery, which was actually uh, covering the whole entire state of Iowa at the time. And um, from there, um, we actually had the, um, the floods of 2008, if you remember, across the Midwest. And oh, I was yes. pulled over to an office called the Rebuild Iowa office. I kind of went kicking and screaming because I had a really good gig at the Iowa lottery, handing out money to people in the, in the beginning. So that was kind of my first taste of retail, if you will. Wow. Um, and then, yeah, and then I got pulled over into another office in government, uh, which is the Rebuild Iowa office. And we were basically tasked with helping to rebuild the state um, after the disastrous floods in 2008. Um, then after that, um, I ended up going to uh, Mid-American Energy, which is uh, pretty much our regional uh, energy company here, and continue to get more and more experience when it comes to disaster-related services as well as communication, and then eventually landed here at hy in 2015. So it has been such a wild ride, uh, but I've also realized a lot of my expertise from my previous positions have played well, especially over the past two years as we've tried to battle COVID-19 and everything else. So it's been uh, quite the adventure. Sure. Oh my goodness. Wow. That's quite a story. The lottery and, and so much more. That's amazing. So um, can you just share with the audience sort of like maybe a mistake that you made when you first were starting out in your career? Uh, what lesson or sort of takeaway would you have learned from that? You know, I'll actually go back to a lesson learned. I also tell my 12 year old daughter this all the time. Oh. And I said, if you have the ability to go abroad or to see something outside of the United States and see the way that people live, the way they work, um, the type of experiences that they have, make sure you do it. I had so many opportunities as I was growing up, at least I, I know through high school and college to actually take advantage of those situations. And I never did. And that would have been the prime opportunity to do it because right now it's so difficult to try and get away, right? For a 12 yes. week or even a six month hiatus of some sort. So um, that was one of my lessons learned, I would say. And it was a long time ago, but I still think about it to this day. It's just to have that 
um, worldly view because there's so much that can be applied to one's job if you get out of just the domestic fields. So that would probably be my biggest advice. Awesome. Awesome. So what would you say so far um, in your career, what's the most interesting thing that has happened to you? Um, I would easily say COVID-19. Um, and I'm sure a lot of other people would say that too, not to not to repeat what everyone else says. But uh, it really was one of those moments where we all have our communications crisis handbook, right? And then you flip to where it says pandemic. And there's a short paragraph that says, um, you know, develop talking points based on situation. And so we really didn't have a handbook. None of us did for how we were going to handle this pandemic. And really, you know, this global crisis has started to continue and, and, and start to grow bigger and bigger and bigger. And every corner that we turned, it had a new um, element of surprise, right? At first it was like, okay, it's not necessarily going to be that bad in the United States. And then it got bad and they got worse and then it started to get better and then it got worse again. So <laughs> learning to be uh, flexible and learning to adapt to change was really important for our team. Um, we were just talking about this at lunch today and it's like, well, how would we classify 2020? Our hair was on fire. How would you classify 2021? It was all about vaccines, right? And making sure we were getting the health um, and wellness of our customers back up to speed. And how would you classify 2022? And I think that just comes down to we all recognized what we had just been through over the last two years, and really just the mental anguish of everything that we had seen. And how do you really take care of your employees now that you're in that situation? And that's been something at Hy-Vee that we've really focused on is making sure we're paying attention to our employees, making sure we're not losing good employees due to burnout that they might be suffering or other things that might be going on at home as a result of COVID-19. And so that's probably big, the, been the, the biggest turning point in my career, as well as my colleagues, too, is just encountering something we had never encountered before, um, but will certainly uh, be in the minds of our children as they grow up. You know, that is such a great point. I never thought about the fact that you guys have been just with your hair on fire for two yeah. straight years, two and a half years, and you haven't really had any time to step back and, and think and process and and now maybe maybe decompress i don't know yeah. um, but that's a, that's a really 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 great point it's just been one thing after another and now well, well hopefully one of the things one of the things that we're right now, especially in communications, is that there there was such a you know go 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 mentality. I think in the right. communications industry across the board, and I can speak regarding my own little sector here. Um, but you know, it we saw a lot of our colleagues in the communications um, world just say, "I need to tap out for a little bit," because if they were so involved in that process. They spent, you know, 16, 18, sometimes 20 hours a day just trying to figure out these different um, issues that were taking place. And right. so I have seen, at least with my colleagues in the industry across the Midwest, a lot of burnout. And so we talk a lot about how do we make sure that our teams are well taken care of, that we're doing the best that we can and, and you know, not keeping the team together, keeping the team happy. Um, what more can we do? We want to take care of our customers. Absolutely. But in order to be that helpful smile in every aisle, you have to have a smile. So you want to make sure yeah. you're keeping your really good employees too. So great segue. The next question I have for you is actually, you know, what would you say are the top challenges for women in grocery now? And I guess maybe burnout, you would say one is one of them? Right. Burnout is one of them, you know, and um, I think also... Um, you're starting to see the industry bring in other outside help um, or resources that maybe it hasn't been that hasn't been there before. Um, you know, for example, here at High V, you know, for years and years, it was you worked your way up from the store, then the store to the corporate office, corporate office into other executive positions. Um, and certainly we still have that and we encourage it. Absolutely. Um, but in order to evolve and to continue to make sure that we're remaining relevant, we also have to make sure that we're hiring people who have those other experiences in other industries. And so um, our team, is, including our leadership team, has kind of gone through that a little bit. You know, you're starting to see some new faces um, that might be coming in at positions higher than they normally would, uh, but they're able to bring kind of a new spin, a new direction um, and bring their experience from another sector or even another retail industry into the grocery industry. And right. that's where you see us diversify at Hy-Vee. That's where you see us do different partnerships is because we're starting to bring in those other individuals that have these connections that can deal with clothing, that can deal with beauty, um, but in, weren't necessarily, you know, uh, starting in a grocery store um, as someone who was maybe bagging groceries and working their way up through that system. I mean, someone who can price, which is fantastic, but they may not be the same person who can necessarily sell beauty items. So right. you really kind of have to look at that and who your um, key players and uh, quite frankly, your champions are going to be. So 
going back to burnout, what would you say are sort of like the things that you would, you know, tips, guidance that you would give to colleagues or maybe, you know, other women in grocery, other women in retail about avoiding burnout or dealing with burnout? Yeah, um, to take care of yourself, right? To make sure that you're getting the rest. I mean, these are key things, but we rarely follow them. <laughs> and, you know, I think it's just taking the half hour to go have your lunch. Um, and also just being with your team. I mean, if you have a good team, um, sometimes there can be a separation between um, those women that are on the executive side of the hallway and not necessarily being connected with their team. And so going down and being and spending time with your team, whether it be in a different building, people want to see that. And I think that also helps um, mentally with making sure we're well connected to our people. You know, the other thing is um, there also comes a time where you have to, We it's hard to turn it off, right? So it's yeah. it's hard for me to say, oh yeah, just turn it off at six o'clock because that's never going to happen. <laughs> but um, I think it's important to prioritize. And now that our worlds have blended together and personal life does blend into work life in this post-COVID world to make sure that you're spending time and you're not um, neglecting your family, because that's where I get my energy back, right? It's making sure I'm spending time with my family, as well as my colleagues, because we have a really good team that's here. And so if you can get those boosts of energy, I still haven't figured out the workout aspect yet, but I'm working on that yeah. in 2023. <laughs> that and more water intake would be key. Um, right. You know, and the other one is, and I've heard this from a lot of my colleagues too, it's okay to go talk to somebody, to get a professional counselor, to get a um, executive counselor that you can talk to um, and be able to just kind of talk through some of the things that you might be experiencing at the executive level as, as a female. And that works really, really well. But sometimes people are um, a little hesitant to admit any of that or go seek that. Right, help. right, 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 right. So talking, going back, talking a little bit more about the pandemic, what are some of the things that hy has sort of implemented, you know, different ideas, you know, uh, that Hy-Vee has implemented in order to adjust the, to the new realities of the pandemic. Right, right. So I want to talk a little bit about some of the community things that we've done, because I could talk all day about different things that the stores have done, but I'm sure they're going to be pretty similar to what a lot of other stores have done. But, um, you know, we had the opportunity to team up with some of our suppliers in the middle of the pandemic um, to give away free produce and to give away free vegetables and to have these kind of drive through events that were taking part in our communities and we put them in our parking lot. Um, we would get bins upon bins of what it, it might be watermelon or it might be apples, um, you know, and so we would work with that supplier to have a fun PR activity that would actually be a drive through event that would take place in our parking lots. Um, and now we've continued that with drive through events for breakfast or drive through events for, you know, ha- passing out candy during Halloween during COVID-19. And that was really a successful um, event that we were able to implement. Um, the other one was just, I think, um, working with our pharmacists and making sure that our pharmacists were really at the top of their game. I mean, they've always been there kind of in the background, but for the very first time in history, uh, we had grocery employees that were being deemed as essential workers. You know, we've always thought of that as firefighters and police officers, military members. But for the first time in history, we have, you know, the grocery employee who's coming to the forefront. It's like, no, they're an essential worker. They, they when they go to work and they stock those shelves, it means a lot. Mm. Um, and so we really did a huge campaign um, on the ability to say we're an essential worker, we're an essential part of the community in order to make sure that it runs up and operates efficiently. So between those two things, um, and also bringing awareness to food insecurity, we've seen those numbers triple here in the Midwest in some places. And um, and that's seen, not over, and, right? Like a yeah, lot of it is not that, over. Actually, it's getting you know, worse. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A lot of people are like, oh, well, that was just a pandemic thing. No, I think it's, yeah, I, I'm, I'm sure yeah. it's getting worse. Yeah, it's getting worse. At least that's what we're seeing right now is, you know, so we're working with our partners at Feeding America as well as as other local food banks is, is there more we can do in our food rescue efforts? Um, You know, when they're picking up the food that is on, you know, we don't want to throw it away. It's still edible, but maybe has a little bruise on the apple, right? I mean, are there different things that we can do to up our game there? Um, So we've gone through a lot of uh, uh, roundtables to try and figure out what are those next steps in that process. So we're making sure that we're able to give as much food as possible to our local communities. And what I found, though, is while we have a big need, there is also 
a huge amount of people that want to help. And so doing those roundups at the register, um, we've been rounding up for the food bank uh, for, I would say, at least the past six months. And we've kind of stayed on that track at, at the, the checkout lanes of asking people to say, hey, food insecurity is still a really big issue. And while we certainly want to be able to help out the other initiatives that are in our communities, um, we have just made food insecurity really um, a, a big plan for us, not only now, but also going into the future. It's it's it, we're, we're seeing it. And if people don't have food, then that's kind of the that's kind of the core of your community to make sure that that people are being OK. Right. Right. Um, yeah. No, absolutely. So I, I was thinking about um, as you were talking about one of the big things that that you like to talk about, which is storytelling and sort of like, you know, how to tell the story, you know, how you would tell a story about food insecurity and and yeah. convey that or whatever. So I want to ask you just, you know. To start with, how do you think storytelling is strategic to a food retailer like Hy-Vee? Um, I think it's key. Uh, it, it, it is it, in order to tell the story and paint that picture of really what it looks like in your community. It is absolutely key. Uh, we recently started something here in the state of Iowa called Iowa Stops Hunger, where we work with a local um, business publication. It's the Des Moines Business Record, and they provide distribution across um, our entire state of Iowa. Now, granted, we go outside the state of Iowa with our footprint, but this is um, an initiative that we have with the business record that is uh, here in the state of Iowa. And they help us storytell. So we tell them stories about what we're doing. Then they go out and they find people who might need help or food or organizations that might need help or food. And they really do help us storytell and paint that picture. It's about resources. It's about funding. It's about volunteering your time. And so to be able to put that into a nice package and be able to present that or have somebody see what the face of hunger looks like, it makes a huge difference. So how can effective storytelling, uh, Tina, help uh, aspects, you know, other aspects of the grocery business like, you know, ESG and community outreach and recruitment and retention and, and those kinds of things? Well, what we're finding out is that those that are younger, that were are, that are applying for our jobs, they that's one of the main things that they want to see it, that your company is doing. Um, they okay, your your company's healthy. Okay, great, they got that. But they want to know more. They want to know what are you doing for sustainability? What are you doing for the people in your community that might be disabled? What are you doing for veterans in your community? And so we're discovering in order to get those great candidates who are younger. They want to know, you know, how are you becoming more green? And tell mm -hmm. me about that and illustrate that. So a lot of the people that I've had the chance to uh, interview for positions that we have open here, um, they come in knowing they've reviewed our social media sites. They see the infographics. They see and they know what our carbon footprint might look like or where we're going oh, wow. with sustainability. And, and so they are looking at those stories. And that is something, you know, I, I will tell you when I was interviewing for a job many years ago, it was like, okay, when are the stats? How many employees? What was right. the sales? What was the profit? Those types of things. Sure. And now the questions that I get asked, it's, well, what are you doing to help out? You know, because I want to be a part of a company that's that has a sense of purpose and is is doing something for the greater good of society. So that's certainly a trend that we're seeing. Interesting. Interesting. So um, last question on storytelling. So how do you think uh, storytelling can sort of enhance mentorship and collaboration among women at Hy-Vee? Mm -hmm. Um, I would say, well, there's one woman, um, actually there's several, uh, that have risen to the level of executive vice president. Um, one who was just named, um, president here at, at Hy-Vee. Her name is Donna Tweeten. And also my, uh, boss who is Georgia Van Gundy. So, and she's our chief of staff and she, th these women have been incredible. Um, they have shown how they've worked through, um, diversity issues. They've shown how they've worked through, uh, break it, broken through some glass ceilings, um, to be honest, you know, here within the company. Um, they have just been amazing mentors and they've actually taken the time out to tell people their story, um, to be able to say, hey, you know, this is kind of my history. Here's what I wish I would have done differently. And going forward, here's some advice I would give you. So that mentorship and that taking the time out to have that special moment um, with another female in particular is so important. And they're teaching us to do that for people who are trying to get ahead as well. And so I just recently had an email from someone at one of our stores and said, hey, you know, I have a checker at our store once an opportunity to, you know, see what Hy-Vee Communications is all about. 
And instead of deleting the email, which I would never do, it's like, well, tell me her name, you know, get, give her, give her my email address. Let's go ahead and let's have a conversation. Because if wow. I can leave a mark on them, so many women have done the same thing for me here at hy V, and it's just my way of paying it back. Oh, that's wonderful. That's wonderful. I love to hear that. So um, are you working on any new exciting projects at hy V? Maybe oh, we are. Over? Yes, yes. We are. <laughs> and I, I told you before this started, I wanted to put in a little plug because it was all across the news in 2022. So we are yep. working on our 2023 IndyCar, Hy-Vee IndyCar race weekend. And um, this is an interesting project. Um, I will be the first to admit um, when I was told we were going to be putting on an IndyCar race, I, I had to do a lot of research on my own because I wasn't necessarily an IndyCar fan at the time. Um, and I went and I worked my first weekend. Actually, I had a lot of anticipation going up and uh, a lot of storytelling that was involved with that. Oh. And when I had the chance to see it come to life, I am a big believer. I'm a huge IndyCar fan. And I think wow. once you go into a race and you get the chance to meet the drivers and meet the people that are a part of IndyCar, it is such a special moment because it is these drivers are so engaged with their fans and they're so in the middle of just wanting to thank everybody that's there to be a part of the event. I have never seen anything like it. So, and you know, they're superstars within the sports arena when it comes mm-hmm. to racing, but right. they will take the time out to make sure that they've had a chance to see you or kiss the baby or say hello or do the media interviews. So um, they've been fantastic to work with. But yeah, so we're on the verge of uh, planning. Well, I shouldn't say on the verge. We are in the midst of planning our 2023 race. What was um, the 2022 one like? Like, what was the schedule? Like, what what was it? <laughs> What was it? It was crazy. It was crazy. Several components, right? Like, yeah, we have multiple components. And what we really wanted to do was it it was at the Newton Speedway in in Iowa. So the city of Newton, Iowa, um, you know, which is a, a smaller community that's that's in Iowa. But, you know, you look at like Sturgis. And it, we kind of wanted to make this the Sturgis of the Midwest. And how do we make it an event where people say, yes, I want to go. And right. yes, it's really cool. And yes, we want to see what else is coming up next. And so, you know, we had acts like Tim McGraw and we had Gwen Stefani and we had Blake Shelton. And so there were people that we were attracting that were not only concert goers, but our goal was to try and change them into IndyCar fans as well. It's one of the fastest growing sports on TV, believe mm. it or not. So I think wow. everyone always classifies, okay, well... We have, you know, the the World Cup or we have something else, but actually racing, IndyCar racing especially, is one of the fastest growing sports when it comes to those that are involved. And a lot of it has to do with like the gaming component or, you know, the tie in to, um, um, you know, racing in general. So you look at NASCAR and you look at IndyCar and you look at some of the other, um, you know, elements that are out there, even go-kart racing when it comes to some <laughs> of the smaller kids. Um, and so we had a great time planning that. And we said, we want to make 2023 bigger and better than um, 2022. And so how do yeah. you do that? Well, um, we're going back to double better. 2022 is pretty amazing. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'll tell you what, anyone who wants to come out, you just give me a call. So, um, but we are putting on our next race, July 26th second and July 23rd of 2023. It'll be back out at Newton and the musical talent that we got before and after the race is bigger and better than it was before. I, in my opinion, we've got Carrie Underwood, we got the Zach Brown bad band. We got Ed Sharon. Um, oh and my it's, goodness. <laughs> yeah. That's, Kenny that's amazing. I know. So wow. when you're buying a ticket to this event, um, not only are you buying it to see the race, but you're buying it to see the musical acts and also take part in all the engagement that we have with suppliers and vendors. And so our suppliers and vendors can actually see these things come to life. And, um, you know, we also are trying to make it so it can be an outing for suppliers and vendors and not just families that are here in the Midwest. It's a truly an event that, you know, you can take and entertain people at, but yeah, we're anticipating, you know, trying to double the attendance that we had last year. So fingers crossed. So Oh my goodness. How exciting. Well, you know, it sounds like an event that is totally consistent with a smile in every aisle, you know, <laughs> yes. friendly Hy-Vee, yes. family Hy-Vee, you know, all of that. So congratulations. Yeah, it's all Hy-Vee volunteers that are out there too. So, which is maybe why you see a lot of smiles and red shirts that are circulating the whole entire speedway, but <laughs> yeah, we're pretty excited for it. And hopefully you can come out too. Oh my gosh. I would love it. Thank you so much. And thank you, Tina, for being on this podcast episode. It's been a wonderful conversation. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. So for more information about the Top Women in Grocery podcast, please visit www.progressivegrocer slash 
podcasts. And you can also subscribe to the series wherever you typically listen to podcasts, including on Apple, Google, and Spotify. And if you have an idea for a Top Women in Grocery podcast episode, we really do want to hear from you. So please send me an email at gacosta at ensembleiq.com. I'm Gina Acosta. See you next time. Thank you again, uh, Tina, for being here. And thank you for listening. <laughs>